The purpose of this video is to give you some insider knowledge, some prior knowledge and a bit of background and key information before you actually tackle the text, The Left Hand of Darkness itself. This text is famously difficult to understand and comprehend. Uh, and you should approach this book as a puzzle for you to unravel and understand. And as this video will show, I'm actually going to suggest that you do a number of different steps before you actually start reading the novel itself. So a bit of background firstly, uh, we're on the planet Gethin and there are two countries described, Carhide and Ogeron. So Carhide is the wintry country that we begin the book in and about halfway through we move on to the second country, Orgrim. It's also important for you to know about the Ecumen. They are uh, sort of similar to the United Nations, a large group of confederated or allied countries and our main character Genli I is a envoy of this group. On the planet Gethin everyone goes through a cycle of fertility basically for 24 days they are kind of genderless or asexual and then for two days they are in a state called Kema which is basically like being on heat if you're an animal and they are have a compulsion to have sex and to mate and to couple. Uh, gender, basically there is none and everyone is referred to as a he, though during the chema phase, which is the sex or heat phase, it's described that the hormones decide who becomes a male or a female uh, and therefore who will bear children and this can alternate depending on the partners that happen and couple in chema. Uh, this is only mentioned once but there's a, a, a certain period or state called dothe or doth uh, which is sort of a, a form of super strength for these people that they can tap into when they need to. There's something called a commensals, which is a group of 33 politicians, and they're basically the decision-making body of Orgarain. Ginley I is, has the ability to mind speak, uh, which is a common practice on the planet he's from. He described himself as Terran, which we basically understand as human, uh, and you crucially you can't lie when you're mind speaking. Uh, but no one on the planet of Gethin can mind speak unless he attempts to teach them. And the last key term is Shif Grethor, and this is not a person, but it's sort of more similar to the concept of saving face, uh, caste system, these sort of things. It has to do with class, manners, politeness, and how you should behave in society. In regard to the characters, just uh, before you start reading the novel or accessing it, uh, the story says that all characters are yellow, brown, or red, brown. Uh, but their Genli is much darker than them. So that should help you to get sort of, they're not aliens, they don't have green, green skin, uh, but they're sort of a, a range of dark skinned humanoid type things. So there's only really two main characters and there's only really four characters you really need to know about. Uh, and the two non-main characters or minor characters are not even really explored in that much detail. Um, so if you read this page, then you'll basically know everything you need to know about them. So the two main characters are Genli I, who as I said earlier, he's the Ecumen Envoy, and he's a Terran and he's humanoid. The second key character is Estravan, and he is the Prime Minister of Carhide at the open of the story, but his position in this role is quickly taken away, and it becomes more about the actions that he performs going forward. The two minor characters, there's King Argavan, he's the king. Basically, Genli's job is to convince him to join the Ecumen. And then there's a man called Tibe, or Taibe, and he is basically a, a Hitler-like character who replaces Estravan as Prime Minister of Carhide. And he's not mentioned in great detail, but he gives rousing speeches over the radio, and that's about all we really know about him. In regard to the novel structure, before you jump in, it's really important to know these four different distinctions and four different types of chapters you'll be reading. Uh, firstly, there's those written by Genli Ai. Uh, there's those written or narrated by Estravan. There's one chapter that's just by a unnamed, unknown female investigator who describes the sex lives of the Gathenians. And then there's five chapters of mythical, uh, sort of folklore type stories which impact on the story, not directly, but they sort of have echoes throughout the text. So just to elaborate a bit on the myth bits, as I've described them here, uh, there are five of them and they sort of set the scene and give a bit of background on the folklore of the areas that the story is set in at the time. So chapter two is the place within a blizzard and this basically describes a story and also that the place within a blizzard is similar to sort of a conception of heaven where those people that have done wrong or perhaps hell uh, meet and can discuss things. Chapter four gives a bit of background to the foretellers before Genli actually goes to visit the foretellers. We get a bit of background on the myth and the legend that is the foretellers who can predict the future. Chapter 9 is a bit of a love story, a bit of a Romeo and Juliet style thing. Uh, two people meet, uh, they fall in love, they perform camera together, uh, but because they're from warring families essentially, 
Uh, one of them is killed, the other one bears a child, that child is then reunited with a father figure, and then peace is restored. Chapter 12 is a myth from Augurain, and it tells the religious beliefs of the people. And finally, chapter 17 is the Orgoda myth, which is the creation myth and sort of the basis of the religion of the people in Augurain. And then I've got here Honourable Mention, which is chapter 7, which speaks entirely about the sex lives of the Gathenians. And I've included this here because these six chapters are probably the ones you could skip and come back to later once you've sort of understood the plot and the key things that are happening in the story. Alright, so as I hinted to at the start, this is my suggested process for comprehension. So obviously watch all the videos that you are now watching here about that I've made about the left hand of darkness. Then listen to the BBC dramatization of the novel. It's about an hour and 40 minutes and it gives you, it's sort of stripped out all the irrelevant parts of the novel that you'll struggle with as you're reading it and just gives you the key information and the key plot points. Then you'll want to listen to the full audio book which is about nine hours and 40 minutes. You might want to listen to it at 1.5 or 1.25 speed to get through it a bit quicker because again, you're just sort of trying to get an understanding of the plot really clearly. Then I would suggest you get your highlighters and your pens out and you read all of the non-myth bits and you leave out the sex scene, the sex summary chapter and you just read the key plot points and you go through annotating for the themes, symbols and motifs which I'll explain in a second. Then finally, once you've got a really good understanding of the plot, the key characters and all the sort of things that I've described here very briefly and you have a more thorough understanding of them, uh, I would go back through the myth bits and the sex chapter and I'd look for similarities and sort of treat it like you would a foil. So how do these little parts of the novel relate to the key events, the key characters and the key ideas of the story. And then once you've done all that you should have done a really good job of unraveling the puzzle that is the left hand of darkness. So in regards to annotating your text you should be looking for these four themes. Gender politics, so what is a man, what is a woman and how does Genli relate to or these ideas impact on him as he goes through the world. Communication, so how do the Gathenians communicate and how does he representing the Terrans or ourselves humans communicate. Uh, where does lies come into it and what role does social status and manners have in the whole interaction. Sociology, so this is just when he's reflecting on people and the way they live and how they live and you could also draw this out a little bit to suggest what messages Ursula Le Guin is making about our world, the world that we live in and also the world that she lived in, in when the book was published around 1969. The last theme is duty and this is you have mostly think about Genli I and Estrovan and how their duty and their commitment to their country, to their politics, to their ecumen, to their network and how these are manifested and how much actual control or choice they have in their lives. Motifs are reoccurring symbols throughout the book, so you're looking for things like trust and truth, secrecy and manners, snow, journeys, love, nature versus man, and also Taoism, which is, it's been suggested a belief that Ursula Le Guin believed in thoroughly, and this is probably something you're going to have to research if you're going to be writing or attempting to write about this aspect of the novel. Symbols are just short-lived pieces of imagery that are woven throughout the novel. Some of the key ones are crime, light and dark, which emerges mostly towards the end of the novel, masculinity and its role in the story, or predictions, blood and the colour red or blood red in this case, and finally yin and yang which is a symbol used to describe Estrovan and Ginli Ai. Good luck reading the book and unravelling the puzzle that is The Left Hand of Darkness by Ursula Le Guin.